Imagine if we had all the notes of all the scientists all together, and many of them had not been published. How preciously would we guard them? How preciously would we preserve them? I hadn't had anything to do with Buddhism for 20 years or so. I found a book on Buddhism in the sandals. I, I, I got up and wrote the, the, the title, you know. It seemed to make a lot of sense to me. I decided India was the place to go. And I got a ticket and set off to spend three or four weeks in Darjeeling. I had no expectation. I just went with an empty mind. I had no idea what I was going to fight. We ended up at 54 Gandhi Road. I walked up and the curtain opened and this very beautiful face appeared. I was sitting with my hands. I don't know what to do with it, you know. <laughs> and uh, Rinpoche was, uh, was laughing at me. Really, Kanji Rinpoche was, was unusual. He looked like he'd built a monastery that morning. He put so much effort into preserving these. This incredible body of Tibetan literature. About five years before the 1959 Cultural Revolution in Tibet, he wrote to the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama felt he should go, and that he should also take with him a copy of the Kanju. Kanju is the actual scriptures that are the, the words of the Buddha. In Tibet, they were being destroyed. If he didn't bring them out, they would be lost. Kanju Rinpoche, his family, 84,000 teachings, filling 18 trunks into some of the hardest territory. There was huge danger. 10% of Tibetans who crossed the border and caught fever and died. He had no ambition then to serve others. This treasure that they have is not bound by culture or gender or tradition. It's for everyone. He thought that we should do the practice. From that point on, the practice of Dharma has spread. These books were so precious. For my father, it was the most important thing.